So I want to welcome everyone to AMBRI's Educate Next CEU Lecture Series. I am Tara Namey, and I am the moderator for today. I am a Senior genetic Specialist in the commercial field of AMBRI Genetics, and we are very excited um, and pleased to have Dr. Rashid Karam available to talk to us today about increasing the positive yield of hereditary cancer testing with concurrent DNA and RNA sequencing. So a few reminders uh, before we get started. Some of our automatic emails may arrive to your junk email folder. Please add us to your known senders. For CEUs, only the live session qualifies for CEUs. You must attend through the GoToWebinar link and the survey at the end of the webinar are required. Call only connection doesn't appear on the attendance report, so you cannot claim CEUs. For, so for the certificates, certified genetic counselors, this is through NSGC, it's a 0.1 category one CEU, and one contact hour per webinar is awarded at the end of the series in December through the NSGC CEU portal. It's better to register with your personal email in case you change jobs. Please provide your NSGC user ID number, not your remote ID on the survey. If you are not a NSGC member, you must create a guest account at www.nsgc.org. And so we just wanna make sure you're using your user ID and not the remote ID. For licensed CLSs, the PACE this is one certificate per session that's awarded, and it's available approximately four weeks post each session. You must keep track of your participation to verify that the CEUs earned are correct. Any questions, you can email educatenext at ambrygen.com. A few logistics as we get started. You were automatically muted when you joined the webinar. The session is being recorded and it will be available on the AMBRI website. The control panels appear on the right side of your screen. From the grab tab, you can hide the control panel, uh, view the webinar in full screen. You are also able to enter questions on the pane. You can ask questions at any time, but questions will be addressed at the end of the webinar. The survey pops up in the web browser after the presentation when you close the webinar window. It will also arrive by email approximately one hour after the presentation is complete. You only need to complete one of these surveys. It will not ask for your name as you are already logged in with the name that you use during the registration. Please complete the survey soon after the webinar so you are included in the att attendees report when we download it in the next couple of days. We cannot add you afterwards. If you are calling in only, you will not receive the survey by email. You must join through the link as well. So we have Dr. Rashid Karam available and speaking us to, today, us, to us today. Rashid obtained his medical degree in Brazil at the Federal University of Health Sciences at Porto Alegre, one of the most reputable medical schools in the country. Rashid has a PhD in oncogenetics and did his graduate studies on the role of the nonsense-mediated mRNA decay pathway in the regulation of the CDH1 gene expression at the University of Porto in Europe and at MD Anderson Cancer Center, Houston, Texas. He did his postdoc at University of California, San Diego School of Medicine, where he focused on RNA biology research. Rashid joined AMBRI Genetics in 2014, and currently he is the director of AMBRI's Translational Genomics Laboratory. Welcome, Rashid. Thank you, Tara. Thank you, everybody, for your time and for joining us on today's uh, Educate Next presentation. So uh, the main focus of today's presentation will be uh, discussing how uh, uh, concurrent DNA and RNA sequencing uh, can increase the positive yield of uh, hereditary cancer testing. 
So full disclosure, I am uh, an employee, a salary employee at Ember Genetics. These are uh, the main objectives of, of today. Uh, and for those, I know I have presented uh, a few webinars uh, previously, including the NSGC webinar. So just full disclosure, the, the introduction part of the talk will be very similar to what I have uh, previously presented. But the data in the second half of the talk where I will summarize the, the paired uh, DNA and RNA genetic testing approach and more specifically uh, the, the, the impact of this approach uh, in the positive yield, uh, this is a, a new presentation, so uh, new data. We, I will be showing you guys today uh, uh, the first 2,500 samples that were analyzed, the data from those, those 2,500 uh, 2, samples that we finished analyzing recently. So the main focus here today will be to address uh, uh, how can we improve the, uh, the, the positive yield for genetic testing. Uh, Holly Laduca just recently published in Genetics in Medicine this really interesting paper where, where they, they, they did an analysis of 165,000 patients that were uh, subjected uh, uh, to clinical genetic testing. And, uh, and, and here you can see that uh, depending on the type of, of selection criteria, uh, that, that, that it's used, if, for example, if a uh, meat uh, uh, diagnostic criteria for breast cancer and ovarian cancer, right, that, that's the most, uh, uh, we get about 20% uh, 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 of the cases that turn out to be positive. But uh, you can see that there is still a room for improvement uh, uh, to, in, to increase the positive yield. One way for us to achieve this is uh, to look at others uh, at, at the RNA level, right? Because currently, as you may be aware, uh, we are looking only at DNA sequences. And many times by looking at DNA sequences, we can really uh, uh, predict or even detect uh, certain alterations depending where, where they are location, located in the gene. The approach that, uh, that we are using also looks at the RNA, so we have then the ability to look beyond the DNA and uh, to evaluate then uh, abnormal splicing patterns that help us to identify uh, uh, new cases and also help us better understand variants that may be otherwise inconclusive or variants of non significance. So over, overall, as the data that Paul uh, uh, Duco showed uh, on, on the gym paper, uh, we know that the positive yield uh, uh, for a cancer is approximately only 10%, right? And that, that has improved over the years with uh, the introduction of, of new technologies and one specific uh, 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 technology that helped increase the, pos the relative positive yield by 5%, for example, was the introduction of uh, del dupa analysis back in 2006. Right, next generation sequencing was also very important uh, uh, because it reduced cost and then allowed us to be more relaxed on the criteria on what genes we were sequencing. And, and a panel testing clinic, I think, was, was very important uh, uh, because then allowed us to focus in, on the genes that we understand clinically, how they behave, and we, there are clear guidelines on how to manage patients as well. One way, uh, but even though with all those approaches, like like discussed, right, all DNA-based approaches, we know that uh, the positive yield is still limited. So th this is a problem, a very common problem that many of uh, of clinicians uh, uh, face on their daily uh, daily practice, right? Cases that you uh, know they meet criteria, you have uh, strong evidence, genetic evidence that uh, uh, you have a, a germline alteration, but we're still not able to detect that germline alteration. We I will be showing you data here today that support that RNA analysis it will help us improve that positive yield by detecting variants that DNA alone cannot currently detect by multi-gene panel testing. And, and it was also uh, interesting, I will be talking today uh, about cancer, uh, but in June, in June 2019, so just a few months ago, this is a group from uh, Stanford and the, uh, the Undiagnosed Disease Network 
uh, published this paper in Nature Medicine that I think is, is a very interesting uh, piece of literature. I strongly recommend that, that you read, where they also use the blood. They perf perform a quite different uh, uh, RNA sequencing too, but a different type of RNA sequence. They perform whole transcriptome in a, in a cohort of approximately 100 patients that previously were tested negative by DNA exome analysis, right? Uh, and, and then they did uh, uh, RNA sequencing, whole transcriptome in blood, and they observed that, that, uh, that this approach yielded a 7.5% a diag uh, uh, diagnostic uh, uh, rate yielded a 7.5% diagnostic uh, rate for this specific cohort. And I thought that was a very interesting study because uh, several of the, it, uh, rare, are rare diseases, not cancer, several of those diseases were uh, re related to intellectual disability. And just by the fact that they can detect those abnormal true RNA, those, those variants uh, uh, in blood, I thought that was a, a very interesting uh, data. And that also supports the approach that we are uh, using here, right? So how can we improve uh, the diagnostic yield using RNA? Uh, you, you may be aware that uh, when we talk about multi-gene panel testing, we're talking about a, a, a DNA capture, right? So the DNA capture, the way it works, we have probes that are designed to capture specific areas of the gene, the, the axons and the areas surrounding those axons, right? And you will be capturing the sequences, and those are the, the, the sequences that you have available. So if you have a, a mutation, a variant here, you'll be able to detect. The limitation of this approach is that we know that we have vast intronic sequences uh, in between uh, the, these axons that are not covered by uh, a capture. And therefore, if you have a variant that it's, uh, that it's located in the intronic sequence of, of the genes, you won't be, chances are you won't be detecting it. Uh, and, and you can see here how complex those intronic sequences can be. There are a lot of regulatory elements there that are important for, uh, for proper expression of the gene. So uh, if you have a variant, for example, that you'll be creating a new, uh, you may create a new splice site that activated a cryptic splice site or impact any of those regulatory elements, you will not be detecting if all you capturing are the, the, the coding sequences and the, and the flanking regions of the, 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 the axon. And how do we use this information uh, to, to help us classify uh, the, those alterations, right? So we, we use the, the, this information to detect variants, but we also use this, this information to help us better understand what a specific variant is doing. So if you find something deep in tronic, uh, you already seen like an abnormal transcript, and we can use this as, as, as functional evidence to support an, a classification. And things that we are looking at specifically when, uh, when we are uh, looking at uh, RNA sequencing data is whether the abnormal transcript will be in frame or out of frame. For example, if your transcript is out of frame, it will, it, it's predicted to result on a premature termination cause on a PTC, and we know that those will be uh, uh, targeted by uh, nonsense mediated decay, right? So we, we can apply uh, 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 criteria uh, for example, PS3, pathogenic strong criteria 3, to help us uh, uh, classify those alterations. I'm not, uh, for the, or the alteration may be in frames. This is something that is very hard to, to predict by using in silico tools only. Imagine if you have a plus minus 1 affecting an axon. Will that uh, variant result uh, uh, on an in-frame event or an out-of-frame event? This is something that is very important for us in variant assessment because if it is in frame, then we need to follow a different workflow. For example, we study specifically how important that region is for the function of the gene. For example, it's a frame skipping of a portion of the BRCT domain of BRCA1. We can also apply uh, this evidence towards the classification of the variant. In, in, in how, how, how important is this data uh, uh, for us to actually reclassify variants? So we have been doing at the, uh, at the ATG lab, retrospective analysis of variants uh, for over three years now. And this is a summary of 100 uh, uh, tumor suppressor gene variants, right? So the, the, how, what we did in this specific work was people were tested by uh, DNA 
And then we identified a variant that was predicted to affect splicing or was re re located in one of the, 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 the nearby coding sequences. So uh, we, we offer to, to these patients the opportunity to submit an additional blood sample uh, so we could retrospectively analyze uh, 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 th those individuals. And this approach really worked when we were able to get the samples from those patients, right? You can see here that from those individuals that submitted uh, samples, 92% of, of, of those cases were initially classified as VUS. And after we did uh, 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 RNA, genetic test, RNA analysis, only 8% of them uh, remained as VUS. And a significant proportion of those the specific cases were upgraded to clinically actionable variants, right? So this is important because those were variants that were previously classified as VUS just because we lacked the evidence to properly classify them uh, as, as pathogenics. But uh, the retrospective approach that we have been doing for uh, the, the last three years, it has, uh, uh, it, it, it has uh, problems, it has limitations. Right. Uh, one of the, the, the limitations is you are still uh, uh, only looking at uh, variants that are inside this DNA analytical range. You're still relying on DNA to find the variant. So you will only be uh, identifying various variants that are located in these areas of the gene. Right. So you cannot detect uh, uh, variants that are outside the, the uh, analytical range. So it only works for VUSs. It's not necessary, and this is the, was the topic of previous webinars. This is not the main topic of this specific uh, uh, presentation, even though I just showed you that uh, retrospectively we can work on a lot of those VUS. The main focus here is like how can we detect new variants too? And one of the, 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 the limitations that we faced, and we are about to publish this data soon too, uh, uh, it's that patients need to come back for another blood draw, right? And we noticed that we offer RNA studies for over like 900 patients and only 10% of them actually followed up and, and send us a, an, an additional blood sample so we could perform this test. So that's when we realized that we were really missing a big opportunity when the plus, first blood draw is performed to actually get the DNA, but also the RNA sample they would allow us to do a more comprehensive analysis of those individuals. And of course, this was uh, done uh, as part of the translational genomics lab, the research lab inside our, uh, uh, inside the lab. So uh, this was done on a research environment, right? So of course, there is no TAT, in, 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 in which with this delay, which was many times perceived as a delay turnaround time so, which has an impact on, 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 on the, the, the clinical impact, uh, which affects the clinical impact uh, of the stat that you cannot deliver this uh, real time. So with all those limitations in mind, uh, over the last year, we put a lot of effort to develop a test that would be able to overcome this, uh, uh, these limitations. And, it, it, this is this is the, 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 the test that, that that we developed, and then, then the data that we will show you today, it comes from this specific workflow, right? So this was a, 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 a the, the goal of this test is to perform DNA and RNA analysis on everyone. So then forget about the retrospective part. Everything now will be prospective. There will be no bias in, in, with regards to selection. Every patient. Uh, uh, that, that we were uh, uh, that we subjected to this study, uh, we performed DNA and RNA uh, analysis simultaneously. Another important thing uh, in, the, uh, in this study was, is that uh, this test is performed on a blood sample, so we we need a blood sample. So one uh, tube we collect one tube uh, blood tube for DNA analysis, right? And another blood tube which is called a packaging tube for uh, to isolate RNA, and it's important that we collect on this specific blood tube because it stabilizes the RNA and allows the, uh, the, the study participants to ship uh, samples from across the country without compromising the integrity of the RNA. And then we run them in parallel in the lab in a very similar workflow. Try to think with uh, as Dell do, right? We we uh, in all the other analysis that we do. 
like that we run them simultaneously. That's how we run this, uh, this campus. And another change you remember, like how I was telling you, the retrospective analysis was done on a research environment. This was done on a clear, uh, uh, on the clear lab at the super lab. So this was on a clinical environment, uh, which allowed us now also to pro uh, uh, provide a real time data. Uh, so the TET is not like a research academic TET, how I used to call, but now it's, it, it, the, the, the goal here is to deliver these results on, on, on a clinical TET, so the same turnaround time that the DNA test has. And what the, 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 the specific uh, criteria that we were looking at, that we are looking at this study, was uh, the impact on the view assets. And uh, spoiler alert, yes, we do see a decrease in view assets. And also the, the, the impact on the positive yield, we also see increase in the positive yield, and I show you details of the data in a few minutes. And, and when we designed this too, we also, uh, we was with already knowing, because we did a forecast analysis, we looked at our report of 207,000 patients that did a, 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 a genetic testing with us in the past, to try to, to, to see how impactful this analysis would be, try to forecast when we were building out this, uh, uh, in, in, in our, we concluded that approximately one in 42 or 2.2 percent of all those individuals tested would benefit from RNA analysis, and this is it's a, it's a conservative number in a way because we are only talking about uh, uh, the VUSs that were uh, pr predicted to affect splicing or VLPs that were predicted to affect splicing. That it's a significant proportion of the VLPs, by the way. But we did not know at this time how many negatives would be uh, uh, affected. But uh, nevertheless, we are seeing an impact that is almost twice the impact that, is, uh, that, that uh, Del Dupe analysis currently has, uh, have on the, uh, has on this cohort, which is less than 1%. So we believe that uh, this test and with our data is supporting that, that it, it will be as impactful as uh, Del Dupe analysis for cancer. These are the genes that were analyzed. So we have polyposis genes, uh, uh, HBOC genes, also uh, Lynch syndrome genes, the MMR genes, and also some syndromic, uh, such as NF1, P10, uh, TP53, and CD81. And uh, again, the outcomes that we were looking for was uh, uh, variant classification, group variant classification, specifically the VUS rate, and the, the diagnostic yields, uh, which specifically the positive yield, impact on the positive yield, which means all variants that were classified as likely pathogenic or pathogenic clinically actionable variants. This is just like also to show here uh, uh, how this, uh, how is it that this RNA, how is it post RNA can detect novel variants? And here is just a schematic of a gene, like I, I mentioned before, for the DNA test, you have probes that will be capturing uh, uh, only those uh, uh, specific coding sequences. And those are the variants that we are detecting when we have RNA, we design probes in a way that it will allow us to detect abnormal transcripts. So once we detect this transcript, we can do further investigation on that, right? So we detect an abnormal transcript here uh, using this approach. And next thing that we do is we compare this transcript that was identified in the patient to a control database. We had to build for this specific assay a large uh, data set of healthy control individuals. So every time we find something on our patients, we can now go, we compare that data that was found in the patients with the data from, uh, 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 from our healthy controls. And you see that we put a lot of effort here to create a very ethnic diverse a cohort with encompassing a, a very broad range of ages in, in, in both genders. Because that's very important. For, like you detect an uh, alternative splicing or you detecting abnormal splicing, right? And that's how we, we differentiate by looking at the database that we developed for this. This is a case uh, uh, that, uh, that I have showed uh, before on other webinars. It, and, and, and the reason of why I'm showing you here today this too is just because uh, I will focus a little on ATM today. I have some very, a very interesting new case that we detected that I would like to share with you, and it was an ATM DP intronic, right? And, and, and there is a specific variant here. Uh, uh, it's a non-variant that we use during the validation process of this, this test. So 
this was a disintronic that we that that, that, that we knew it was uh, pathogenic from the literature. And the goal during the validation was like, can we detect this variant by you this uh, this alteration by using RNA? And th these are called Sashimi plots. And the way you read them, uh, so you, th th those peaks they tell you the number of reads that align to a specific annotated axon, right? So uh, uh, here I, I ask our bioinformaticians to color this, uh, the sashimi plot uh, in a way that uh, the tuna is our pa uh, uh, the patient, and then the salmon here are all the controls. So these are all different individuals, and you can see here in controls that you have peaks of, uh, of RNA peaks aligning to the to the axon. But then you have this read showing that this axon connects to this other axon here specifically, right? Uh, 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 which means that this is proper splicing. This is a normal splicing. You want to, the intronic regions are removed from the mRNA, right? So you have reads connecting this axon with this axon. In the patient, what we see is that we have reads, reads connecting the, the axon with somewhere else inside the intro. And, 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 and the, the program tells us it's resulting in an insertion of 137 nucleotides. That's what we are seeing here. And that's the pathognomonic sign that tells us that there is a splicing going on there. So what, what we do next is like we know now have a genomic coordinate for this specific event, that's in that, that insertion. So we can go back to the DNA level and look at the patient specifically what that change is doing. And what this change is doing in this patient is uh, uh, creating a new uh, donor site. It's strengthening uh, a, a cryptic uh, acceptor site, for, sorry, uh, in, inside the intro. And this acceptor site now will result in the cell identifying that specific area of the gene as an axon and in, resulting in the inclusion of this uh, pseudo axon or, or this 137 nucleotide, which is out of frame, and therefore we can predict that this to be a, 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 a loss of function allele. And by a matter of fact, after uh, uh, the, the test, when we were already running this with patients, we were able to identify this specific alteration in a patient with family with pancreatic cancer in family history of pancreatic cancer. So it was great that we were actually able to detect this sample, uh, uh, this previously correct identified variant uh, in the patient uh, uh, too. So this is, is the intro, and, and, and here now the new data that, that, that I would like to share with you for, for, for the second half uh, of, the, the, of, of this presentation. Uh, so the, uh, the the analysis for, for the first uh, two, uh, 2,500 prospective cases that were uh, submitted for uh, a pair DNA and RNA genetic testing. So th th this is a study we are collaborating with uh, uh, 17 uh, institutions across the country. Uh, so they are the ones performing the counseling, of course, and selection of what tests should be done. If they are the ones. That, that decide uh, 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 the, the specifics of what test is run. Uh, but what we did ask is for each one of those patients to send us a blood sample, uh, two, blood, uh, two blood tubes, one for DNA and one of, of for RNA. They are both collectly concomitantly and then tested simultaneously. Uh, and then we, we evaluate the impact on the diagnostic use for those 18 cancer predisposition genes that we discussed earlier in evaluating impact on variant classification and, and VUS rate. So for the data for the, the first 20, uh, 2,500, the, the part that we were in, in, interesting the most was uh, the impact, as, as we discussed, the diagnostic yields, right? And this was very exciting for us to see that in this uh, cohort of individuals, we are observing a 6.7% uh, relative increase in the diagnostic yield. So these were cases that were either inconclusive, but half of them were actually negative cases that would have not been uh, identified if we were not running uh, 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 the, the uh, uh, RNA simultaneously. Uh, a 4.5% uh, relative decrease in the US rate that's another interesting piece of data that we obtained from, from, from this cohort. 
remember when I showed you the retrospective data that I showed you that we can reclassify virtually 90% uh, of all the VUSs, but those VUSs, we pre-select them, they were splicing VUSs, right? Here, what we are looking at is on the overall VUS rate, so without doing any selection. So what is the impact on the overall VUS rate? And we are seeing a relative decrease of 4.5% in, 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 in our, in, and I think these are great numbers. And, and one thing that I always like to, to stress, that, to highlight here specifically too, that this is a, 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 part, a number that it's always evolving. The more cases we see, the better we understand and the more variants will be reclassified in our uh, uh, clinical reporting team. Uh, it's independent uh, from the few teams and depend from the research team they are conducting all this thinking on, on, on the patients only and, uh, it, it, and they are being conservative as they have to be. So if there is any need for additional follow-ups, they are requesting these additional follow-ups either through orthogonal validation, uh, verification, but also by other genetic needs, for example, segregation, detailed clinical history. The team keeps working on those values so we can improve, we can expect that these numbers will uh, improve uh, over time as well, and will change over time. W one cool thing about this is that even though these were the number of individuals that were actually tested, we it did impact a, a, a patients that have been tested previously. Because if once you reclassify a VUS uh, uh, or, or identify the novel variant, as long as the variant is captured by the, by the, at the DNA level. We can go back in time, uh, uh, and, 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 and we have, and we do that. Not we can, we do that when we go and look and and, and, and send amended reports or reclassification reports to all patients that were uh, affected by uh, reclassification. So this this is one of the, the cases that I really I, I was really excited uh, with the, the results that I would like to share uh, with you. And that was the part why I was reminding you of, of that ATM sample that we used for validation. So ATM is a huge gene, gene right? Has a, 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 a approximately, a, if I'm not wrong, 68 axons. So we would expect ATM to have to be one of the genes that would have a big impact uh, 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 by this specific assay. Because can you imagine all the last nucleotides, all the, the splice type variants? But also, uh, we, we knew also that ATM. Uh, uh, has, it's a very complex has, it's splicing that deep intronic variant would also be something that we were expecting to detect on this gene and hence why we added that deep intronic ATM to the validation. So this is a sample that was part of the, the first 2500. Uh, so it was a Caucasian female with breast cancer diagnosed at the age uh, 44 with a family history of paternal grandfather uh, with lung cancer at, at, at 76. Uh, so when we looked at the RNA data, here you can see the sashimi plot. Uh, again, the tuna is the patient where we saw, yes, the normal splice, but we also saw abnormal splicing. We saw reads showing, uh, uh, being aligned to somewhere in the intron, that it's not an annotated axon, right? And then when we looked at the control individuals, you can see that uh, the, the control individuals only have normal splicing, so this axon it's splicing to this axon here. So this is that pathognomonic sign that really made us like look what is going on in this region. And you can see here when compared, this is a specific uh, R dots that we detected. So it's an insertion of out of frame nucleotides. So of a pseudo axon, we can see that only the patient expressed this, uh, this abnormal RNA. It's not, wasn't identified in any of our uh, control uh, individuals. So that was, for us, a very interesting case. So what we did next, we got this genomic location and we went to the DNA of, of this patient and we did Singer analysis. And what it was very cool to see uh, uh, that indeed uh, that, that variant aligned perfectly to uh, this change uh, in the DNA here, which translated to a C dot would be at a plus 1550. Uh, G to C. And you can see what this variant is pretty much doing uh, just by eye here. You can see there is a AG, which is the canonical sequence for the acceptor side. 
now you you adding this uh, 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 C to G uh, or G to C change here, which probably being a pyrimidine, which is the favorite position for a, a, a minus three, would increase the the, the the strength of this cryptic site. And indeed, that's what it is. What it does, we checked uh, uh, in silico predictions. Uh, this is what I was talking about, right? Like uh, uh, now, uh, when you look, for example, this is HSF. Uh, uh, this variant is pushing this. A, a cryptic percent uh, tra confidence uh, threshold. Now it's pushing this up to 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 their uh, 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 to above eighty percent, right? So what this the alteration is doing is specifically, as I mentioned, is to strengthen a cryptic slice site uh, that is located inside the intron. So it, it, the so we have the RNA data, we have the DNA variant now, and the DNA variant, according to Silico, is predicting to strength a, a, a cryptic uh, a sector side with deep intronic. So all the, those pieces of evidence are being added, right? So the next thing, of course, checking uh, uh, for uh, uh, population database, we want to see if this variant is where, if it's a variant that was never described, uh, never described before, or if it's something that is common. So we, we look, take advantage of the NOMAD database, and you can see here, so it's very deep, in, deep into the intro. So we only have genome uh, 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 reads, uh, but even uh, very, very good coverage, 30x. And you can see that this variant is not uh, found on, on the NOMAD database. So now we have uh, 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 rarity too. So you were uh, uh, preparing to, to reclassify this variant in, uh, very coincidentally, we got we get a second case, uh, and the second case also interesting: Caucasian female with breast at 68, with family history of breast cancer, sister uh, at 42, uh, mother with breast at 57, maternal grandmother grandmother with uh, breast at unknown age. And what is important here is that we detect that same the splicing signal that we, on that previous individual that we were just uh, discussing, we detect the same splicing abnormality in this individual, the same R dot, and again, not present in the controls as we knew already, only present in this individual. So this, the, the plot is thickening here. Now we have another uh, individual, and, and the first thing we did is, okay, let's look at the DNA. We run Sanger sequencing of this alteration, and that it was, again, the, the, the deep intronic G to C at that specific position is strengthening the, 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 the scriptic acceptor site. So all together, and in addition to this, so the, the RNA, uh, uh, the plus RNA case, the both cases, like I said, this was a never before, never described variant before, right? So it's completely new, there was no literature uh, uh, about it. Uh, so we, we the, the, the clinical reporting team uh, is very conservative. So they, in these specific scenarios, they are asking us to run our orthogonal method. And I think that's fantastic. I always say in molecular biology, one of the goals is like to show the same thing using as many techniques as possible, right? We are the lab that loves to run Sanger confirmation, MLPA confirmation. So uh, 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 we run our orthogonal method here. That is the assay that the ATG lab has been running. Uh, 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 which is the RT-PCR sick, right? And, and, and this is also important for the concept of RNA genetic testing overall. When we talk about DNA genetic testing, we're not talking about only MGS. Like I said, there are many other different approaches that we use, MLPA, microarray, uh, 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 Sanger sequencing, right? So under the umbrella of DNA genetic testing, in the same way I believe you should think of RNA genetic testing, there is a, several techniques that we can use uh, and the capture is one of them, but we also use a PCR uh, 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 approach as well that help us uh, to confirm that, that specific uh, data. And we did. We run for the same individual. We run those two different assays, and you can see that both show us the insertion of the pseudo axon uh, uh, in the deep, the deep intronic uh, uh, in HEM. And here you can compare the second individual as well. So the sashimi plot, right, for the second, for all in the controls showing complete uh, uh, lack of expression of this abnormal transcript uh, in controls too. 
So all this data, we put this all together, and then our uh, uh, the reporting team performs the variant assessment and reaches the, the, the final classification, always following up ACMG guidelines, of course, uh, and, and the criteria met specifically for this uh, likely pathogenic variant. It was a PS3, so RNA data, two patients, uh, like, and as I showed you, rarity, uh, and in silico evidence. Uh, the strict criteria combined is enough classification for the LP. And, and, and then just because I, I, I think this is, it's really cool ATM, it's one of those genes that we are seeing a tremendous impact uh, uh, so far. And I, I would like to bring back to, to, to Holly's LaDuca paper uh, at Jim, like, because they just analyzed 165,000 individuals that were tested and, and they provide this updated cancer risk and, 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 and just like to remind everyone about like ATM, like predisposition to breast cancer, but also predisposition to, to pancreatic cancer. So the, the ability of detecting variants in these, in these genes, especially when you talk about common phenotypes and relying on those uh, additional assays, it's very important. So we can uh, detect those variants and, and provide a, a proper medical uh, follow-up to, to those individuals. And uh, I'm almost done here, so we're supposed to be 45 minutes, right? So I still have a, I still have a few more minutes. And for those individuals that may have not seen previous presentations, uh, I just want to go very briefly on a few cool cases too. So the format here for the last, so this is I think my last three slides. It will be one case per slide, just kind of to show you those were all cases that were negative before, right? And after we run RNA, we were able to. to to, to report this to patients, this was a very interesting uh, DRC1 variant, uh, minus nine, that was identified in a, pro, a female proband uh, uh, with, that had that diagnosed of, was diagnosed with breast cancer at 25, at 35, at 33, and then with ovarian cancer at 44. It, it, this being like a really, a, like we could have prevented that if we knew before, right? That this variant is indeed pathogenic, and you can see here the sashimi plot, the same rationale as before, this abnormal R dot only present in the patient, not present in any of the controls. And then here you can see the specific the R dot, the event in the patient compared to the controls. So this was a very interesting case in BRC1. Another case in BRC1, too, also a previously negative, a plus six, right? So it's a proband uh, female Caucasian uh, of Ashkenazi Jewish descent, diagnosed with breast cancer at age 49. Here is the R dot, the axon is skipping, that's what this variant is doing. You can see here the, 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 the reads supporting this axon here, is it to this at once, so this axon here is skipped. You see that this is only present in the patient, not present in any of the controls. And here in the controls, you can also see they only have normal splicing. So very cool, clean case there as well. And just the last example, it's a, a MSH2. There was also negative, uh, very interesting clinically, I think, because it sh uh, uh, we identified this variant in the end uh, in a patient that was asymptomatic. Her, her sibling, they have previously been tested and found to be negative in the germline. Uh, 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 her, their relatives with uh, the family meets Lynch uh, Amsterdam criteria. So it was one of those cases both affected the siblings with uh, the sister with endometrial and, and the, the brother with a rectal at 29 were previously tested, nothing was found in the germline. Then we tested using the pair DNA RNA. Uh, there's a symptomatic the, the, the irony, uh, the symptomatic sister, and then we found the minus 12 because of the abnormal transcript was detected. And then we went back to every but one and look at their DNA and they were all positive for this minus 12 variant classified as pathogenic. So this, just a few examples, there are so many. Uh, 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 I, I tried my best to add actually the, the, a new case, the ATM case, but there was very, a lot of other cases. And, and I think the more we test, the more examples we see. And I think another interest, important thing of, 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 of keeping accumulating data is that we will allow us to look things on a, on a gene by gene basis on a disease by disease basis, and we can we'll be able to have a better idea in the future what genes are impacted the most. And, and, and we can have a glimpse of this. And remember, this is 
preliminary data. We are ongoing, uh, doing ongoing analysis of all this, but we can see the genes that are being affected the most at the diagnostic yield ATM, right? As we described today, I gave you one example, there were more examples from ATM, but 90% uh, increase in the diagnostic yield. Uh, uh, and then BRC1, 14% at MSH2, 13%. So there were many cases. This is what I showed you is the tip of the iceberg. But the important thing is those reports are getting, uh, uh, are reaching the patients now, right? So uh, which what, what we really hope to achieve here. And with regards to VUS, same thing, same story. The, the, the VUS rates change depending on the, the gene, but we can see a consistent uh, 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 trend in decreases in VUS. And here we are not selecting them any for any specific uh, uh, disease perspective, right? So this is the overall impact, relative overall impact on, on, on the on the VUS. And you can see here the genes that are being affected uh, the most. So in summary, uh, pairs, DNA, and RNA genetic testing improves the variant detection, as I exemplified with that novel dipentronic variant, and also improves a variant classification. And that uh, consequently uh, decreases resulting in a decrease in the VUS rate, and also, as discussed, uh, impacts the positive yield as well. And I think we have 10 minutes for questions. Thank you very much, Rashid. That was excellent and obviously very interesting data. I think we have um, a few questions. Uh, just remind everyone that you are welcome to ask a question, unmute yourself, or you are also able to use the, the question box to ask questions. So let me take a look here. Um, one question, would whole genome sequencing provide, sorry, this is very small to read. Provide the same data and information. No, right? Whole genome sequencing only provides you the DNA data. And the issue with whole genome sequencing is like, okay, you can sequence the entire genome, if you wish, but then uh, uh, the intronic sequences, specifically, right, in, uh, intronic sequences, they are poorly conserved, and there are a lot of, uh, there is a lot of variation in intronic in sequences, so you would, what, if without functional data to guide you, what, you will end up detecting a ton of U.S.s, that what, in, in the end, clinically, what the impact of sequencing the entire intronic uh, regions uh, would have. For those genes, so take it, it cannot pro provide the same level of evidence that RNA does because RNA it's going it's only let it's already selecting variants based on how in, what impact they have on the function on splicing because we are detecting the abnormal transcript and then we go back and look at the DNA. If you look at the DNA first, you ended up with thousands of sequences and, and without having any functional evidence to support their impact. Uh, you, you, you won't be able to reach any classification other than uh, U.S. unless you have a lot of clinical data and, and, and other lines of, of evidence that you could apply. Okay. Thank you, Rishi. We have someone who's raising their hand. I'm going to try to Um, let's see. So another question, you note 6.7% relative increase in diagnostic yield. What is the absolute increase then? 0.06% question mark? The, the relative increase, uh, I need to double check the numbers, but like I can tell the, the absolute increase for the first 1,000, because I was just working on that data, uh, uh, it went from 77 individuals if they would be, have been detected if it was uh, a DNA only to 84 individuals that were detected uh, with this this approach. So that from uh, out of a, a thousand, we saw uh, an absolute increase of seven 
individuals for the first 1,000. So from 77 to 84, absolute numbers. And um, go ahead, we have someone wants to ask a question. Aura? Am I unmuted? Oh yes, you are, go ahead. Okay, so yeah, it was just in, in follow up to that in terms of this relative increase, if you can just, um, that's expanding from the first thousand to the 2500 or the, those are you have those absolute numbers also no the, these are the absolute numbers for the, the first 1000 i don't have the the absolute numbers for the 2500 uh handy here uh uh yes so for the first 1000 we the absolute numbers went from 77 to 84 positive variance to the positive. So I'm just not, I, I don't get the 6.7. So if it, half of them were, were novel, that were RNA novel detected, I don't understand the 6.7% relative yield stat. Uh, so so it's from the overall uh, positive yield for those uh, specifically, uh, for, for those individuals, right? Uh, we Any additional case that is added there, it will count to the, the relative increase sorry you may have been muted this is good, this is good uh, 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 feedback yes uh, uh, for the uh, I will aim to add uh, the absolute numbers as well okay thanks Okay. Um, are there any recommendations for retesting individuals with significant family history who previously tested negative on panel testing? My opinion is, with regards as, as any time a new technology, it, it's introduced to genetic testing. I think it makes sense. I think people may uh, still remember when. Uh, the LDUP analysis was introduced, right? If you had BRC1, BRC2 negative cases, or when panel testing was introduced, uh, I, I think this is uh, uh, additional technology that will help us uh, to detect previously negative cases uh, as, as a exemplified here. And specifically for family, so this has a potential to impact anyone that was tested negative, but absolutely, this, especially the families that have uh, a strong clinical presentation, uh, Lynch syndrome uh, or TP53 and F1, uh, P10 uh, uh, or meet diagnostic criteria for HBOC. Those that have strong presentation, you as a clinician feel like, how is it possible that this patient tests negative? This may help. And of course, we don't expect the negatives to disappear. It, it's, it's another tool to help. Uh, towards improving the, the positive yield, uh, but it's also something that you can rule out, right? For example, uh, yes, you test that and now you know if it, it, you, there is no dip in tronic, you can rule that out as well. And, and, and I think that's also important uh, when we work, you're working up like a specifically family that is negative. Okay, another question. Um, Asking about the increase of deep intronic mutations that were identified or yield increase not due to reclassifying a variant. So do we have data specific to um, the increased detection of deep intronic alterations? Yeah, that's good feedback too. And, 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 and I think like uh, like uh, Or was asking before too, I think it, it also would be good in the future to highlight that like the absolute numbers, but how many actually are coming from the, those negatives. All the all variants that I presented today were not US, they were negatives uh, for, for us at Embry and, and they moved to pathogenic because of the RNA data. But overall, half of the, the, the increase in the, the relative diagnostic yield is coming from detection of new variants and not from US reclassifications. The other half are coming from VUSs that are being moving to, to clinically actionable pathogenic or likely pathogenic. 
at, at real time, which is cool too, because we were doing retrospective studies for those VUSs, right? But it's cool to see uh, that, that uh, now instead of having to wait like for publications, maybe like who knows how many years, or even our retrospective program, which may take uh, 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 several months to now have a, 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 being able to reclassify those almost real time, at least uh, in a couple of weeks. It, it, it has uh, important value too. Great, another question um, asking about the application to other genetic single gene disorders. And would this be applicable as well? Uh, right now, we are focusing on cancer, but but uh, uh, I think NF1 it's one interesting gene that is in this panel that that I that that I think it, it's an interesting approach to uh, to uh, to to request to test people on the with NF1 neurofibromatosis, right? Meeting diagnostic criteria. Uh, test them both at the DNA and the RNA level using this approach. I think it's one of the genes that has a lot of potential to benefit. But uh, in the future, other syndromic uh, genes uh, uh, also they have huge potential to benefit. As long as the gene is expressed in blood and the tumor suppressor genes are, and uh, uh, and the also the mechanism of disease is loss of function. Right, uh, uh, we can expect that uh, RNA will uh, uh, have a positive impact on them as well. Uh, one more question: Can you explain how the impact by um, when talking about impact by specific gene categories, the categorization there um, was calculated, was calculated or analyzed, and how you came up with that data per yeah. on each? Well, gene? Was was this the same approach as the overall? Right, but we, then we're just looking at uh, a gene by gene. So what, what is our positive rate of, for DNA for DRC1, for example? And then now with the DNA, RNA paired, uh, uh, what is the change we are seeing in, in terms of like the positives that, that were detected compared to the DNA only? And then from there, we cal calculate this rel the, the, the relative increase. Okay, and I think we have time for one more quick question. What is the RPMK in the y-axis of the Shishimi plots? Oh, the yeah, th th that pretty much tells you the number of reads uh, uh, that are specifically aligning to uh, to to the specific area detected by uh, by the RNA sequencing. Okay. Thank you. Rashid for an excellent presentation. Thank you everyone for joining us. And just briefly, um, also our next Educate Next CEU series topic will be bioinformatics and computational terminology for the clinic, how to talk shop with a lab by Roshona Le Levy and Bryce Sarver. And that will be, take place on October 11th.